join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You are going to hear a conversation taking place in the airport. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Good afternoon. Welcome to Northwest Airlines. How can I help you today? I'd like to check in for the two o'clock flight to Nairobi. Okay. Oh, that flight has been moved back to 2.45. Nothing major, just a weather delay that the plane experienced in Casablanca. May I have your name, please? Sure. It's Jim Harkness. Is that Harkness with two S's? Yep. And that's Jim with one M. Got it. Oh, I see you're connecting from Beijing. You sure are getting around. Yeah. I'm the director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature in Beijing. I'm going to Nairobi for a conference on conservation planning. Fascinating. Will you have any luggage to check in? Yes. One bag, one carry-on, and one laptop. Fine. Put the bag on the scale, please. We are going to fill out customs forms before departure. Can I ask about the contents of your check-in bag? Sure. It's clothing, personal effects, some gifts, and a few books. Thanks. What seating would you prefer, aisle or window? I'd like a window seat, three rows back from those large TV screens, if possible. Let me see here. We have one four rows back. Is that okay? Yeah, I just hate being right in front of those screens. Then I have to watch every dumb movie that comes on. Now look at questions 8 to 10. As the talk continues, Answer questions 8 to 10. I understand. Is that your carry-on? Yes. I bought it in India last year. It sure is a nice bag. Unfortunately, I think it's too big for the overhead storage compartment. Maximum dimensions for carry-on baggage is 16 inches wide by 10 inches high by 21 inches long. Oh, well, it's okay with width and length but it's 12 inches high. Are you sure that it won't fit? I've squeezed it in before. No, I'm sorry. You'll have to check it in with an agent prior to boarding. All right. It's no big deal. One final thing. Do you have any DVDs that you purchased in China? Yes, I have my own music CDs. Okay, that's fine. We're not allowed to transport DVDs. We're working on controlling copyright regulations imposed by WTO. Sure, I understand. Is that everything? Yes, it is. You have a wonderful flight now. Thank you. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear a talk on cultural shock. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16.
Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Hi, congratulations on finishing orientation for our study abroad program. Before you all head off to your respective countries, however, I want to first share with you a little bit about dealing with culture shock. Recent studies in intercultural experience have shown that there are distinct phases of adjustment which virtually everyone who lives abroad goes through. You won't be the exception. The first phase of culture shock includes gaining an awareness of the host culture, preparing for the journey, and farewell activities. You're all experiencing this right now. The second phase begins when you arrive in your new country and ends when the excitement of the early experiences wear off. When you first get there, you will be overwhelmed. Initial impressions convey a sense of monumentality of the experience. You'll love it. During the third phase, you will start taking a more active role in your setting. This will produce frustration because there will be some difficulty in coping with even the most elementary aspects of everyday life. I remember not being able to find a toilet one day because I forgot the word for bathroom. Anyhow, your focus will shift during this phase to the differences between your new host culture and your home cultures. This can be troubling, but these sometimes insignificant difficulties can be blown into major catastrophes. That's why the stage is most often referred to as culture shock. Now look. At questions seventeen to twenty, as the talk continues, answer questions seventeen to twenty. But relax. When this stage is over, you will slip into the gradual adjustment stage. You may not even be aware that this is happening. You will just begin to orient yourself and to interpret subtle cultural clues. The culture will become familiar to you, and you'll start to feel at home. The next phase will be your discovery that you have the ability to function in two cultures with full confidence, and you may even feel completely integrated into your new host culture. In this phase, you will also start to have a sense of shared fate concerning events abroad. The last stage is the re-entry phase when you return home. This can be for some the most painful phase of all. You will be excited about sharing your experiences, but you will realise that you have changed and won't be able to explain how or why. One set of values has already been instilled in you; another you will have acquired in your host country. Both may seem equally valid. It is important that you realise that all of these phases. Are a natural part of adapting to a new culture. Expect peaks and valleys during your stay, and feel free to discuss your feelings with the resident director. These culture shock phases tend to occur even with relatively short stays abroad. During your stay, if you feel a wave of bewilderment wash over you, remember this little talk and look back at your notes. One very typical reaction against culture shock is the tendency to hang out with other Americans. Remember. You are coming to a foreign country to get to know her people, language, and culture better. If you avoid contacts with the foreign language, you cheat yourself and lengthen the process of adaptation. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You are going to hear a conversation between a moderator and two students. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions.
Today we will hear two views of the book Fast Food Nation: The Dark Side of the All American Meal by Eric Schlosser. Many have deemed this a fascinating socio-cultural report that explains how the development of fast food restaurants has led to the standardization of American culture, widespread obesity, urban sprawl, and more. Well, I think that Schlosser's book promises a lot, but delivers less than a highly hyped fast food meal. The book is not well written, and it lacks organization as it skips around in its telling of fast food horror stories. And then he spends a great deal of time on Walt Disney and bashing Disneyland. Why is that in a book about fast food? Bashing is the best word for this book. According to this book, Schlosser clearly believes that the fast food industry is responsible for every problem in America today, from the common cold to inflation to malls to unruly kids to warts. He blames it all on big business. And especially the big food business. The book is written in a breathless, alarming motive that makes it sound like McDonald's and Disney are co-conspirators to take over the world and force every living child to eat greasy French fries. Give me a break. Schlosser is also very biased for the left, praising unions while ripping right-wing values and Republicans. Nixon seems to get special attention. Just having your picture made with him gets sinister pros and makes you a co-conspirator. Despite claims of research, there are numerous blatant assertions such as parents in the 80s spent more money on their children because they felt guilty about not spending time with them. How does he know that? Is all consumer spending on kids really driven by guilt? The book is a farce. Save your money to buy a Big Mac and read something else. Only read this ridiculous book if you are an anti-republican, anti-big business. There are evil forces everywhere subverting the world. Fan. Thank you, William. Now look at questions twenty-six to thirty. As the talk continues, answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Now we'll talk to another person with a very different assessment of this book. So, Jenny, what did you think of Schloss's book? Wow, where do I begin? I thought that this book was very informative, very well researched, and a very easy read. Schlosser did a wonderful job of organizing the vast amount of information that he placed in this book. For a non-fiction book, I found that Fast Food Nation kept me entertained throughout its entirety. In fact, I couldn't put it down. The history of the fast food industry itself was fascinating, as well as the background information on the potato and meat industries. The first-hand accounts given by people who work for the fast food industry, as well as the meat packing and potato plants, added to the reality of the points the book was trying to make. The fast food industry and all industries supported by fast food companies have some serious issues that need to be addressed by the nation. In addition, Schlosser does an excellent job of pointing out the dangers of not only working for these businesses but eating food supplied by them. It's scary to think about the dangers lurking behind the counter at your local fast food chain. This book really opens your eyes to some health hazards that all of America should be aware of. Everyone should read this book. It will change your eating habits and the way you view large fast food corporations. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You are going to hear a talk on Anne Bonny, a female pirate. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five.
Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Anne Bonny was one of the two most famous female pirates. She sailed on the crew of Calico Jack Rackham. Anne was romantically involved with Calico Jack, but she could be counted as none the less as fearless as any other pirate. She was born in County Cork, daughter of an attorney and his maid. The lawyer left Ireland in disgrace, but found fortune in the Carolinas. There, he amassed a fortune and bought a large plantation. A ne'er-do-well pirate sailor named James Bonny married Anne in an attempt to steal the plantation, but Anne's father instead disowned her. Bonny then took Anne to the Bahamas, where he turned informer to Governor Woods Rogers, turning in any sailor he didn't like as a pirate for a handsome reward. Anne quickly grew to dislike her spineless husband and quickly caught the eye of one Calico Jack Rackham, a pirate of some renown. Governor Rogers had recently passed an amnesty for pirates, which left Bonny out of work. The admiration between Anne and Calico was mutual. Calico Jack was a handsome man who knew how to spend money as well as steal it. Anne was a well-endowed lass with a fiery spirit and a temper that matched that of any man. In any event, Calico offered to buy Anne from Bonny, but Bonny instead took the matter up with Governor Rogers, who said that Anne was to be flogged and returned to her true husband. That night, Calico and Anne slipped out in the harbour, stole a sloop, and began a life of piracy together. Now look at questions thirty-six to forty. As the talk continues, answer questions thirty-six to forty. Anne fought in men's clothing, was an expert with pistol and cutlass, and considered as dangerous as any male pirate. She was fearless in battle, and often was a member of any boarding party. In October of seventeen twenty, retribution was close at hand. The governor of Jamaica, hearing of Calico's presence. Sent an armed sloop to intervene and capture the captain and crew. Calico's ship Revenge was caught by surprise, and much to Anne's dismay, the pirates fought like cowards and were taken far too easily. Anne and Mary Reed were also captured, but upon capture, confessed their sex and pleaded to be tried separately after they gave birth. Both women were pregnant at the time. Both received separate trials from the men, but were still sentenced to hang. Mary Reed escaped the hangman by dying from fever while in jail. Anne, however, received several stays of execution before mysteriously vanishing from official records. It is believed that her father, who had contacts in the island, forgave his daughter for her acts and ransomed her back to the Carolinas, where she assumed a new name and a new life. You now have half a minute to check your answers.